Okay, I'm here. Let me just, uh, I'm just getting one thing set up really quick so I can get going here. All right. Oh, let me do the view there. I think we've got it. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, here we go. So, uh, today, yeah, another snow day. I, I can't believe we've had like two snow days, um, in, in, in a week, basically one last Thursday and then this Thursday. And in fact, APS was even delayed this time. And, uh, not only that, I've got two sick kids and, um, sick wife and I'm on my way. I, I'm already getting a little, uh, uh, runny nose here. Hopefully it won't be too bad. Luckily, we've all tested negative for COVID a couple of times. Okay, so today, uh, what we want to talk about are membranes. So we're going to talk about the structure and function of membranes, and then we're going to talk about diffusion, osmosis, and then after that, we're going to talk about transport and transport processes, uh, like active transport, both um, uh, through pumps and through co-transporters as well. And so some of this stuff is not in the chapter. It's actually in the book. It's just in later chapters. So I'm going to get you kind of primed for some plant and animal form and function. And uh, I can hear my kids in the background playing. At least they're happy, even though they got runny noses and little small fevers. Okay, so let's start with um, uh, phospholipids. They, of course, form a membrane. And when we talk about cell membranes, you know, we, we use all of these different terms. We might have plasma membrane, phospholipid bilayer, cellular membranes. Basically, all of these terms mean the same thing. These are the membranes that surround our cells. And when we start talking about eukaryotic cells, well, the organelles, there's membrane bound structures inside of our cells. They are also surrounded by membranes, which are the phospholipid bilayer. Now, phospholipid, that's a bilayer, that's a lot, right? But let's just break this word down. It's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, phospho means there's a phosphate head on there. You've got a lipid, so there's a phosphate attached to a lipid, and it's a bilayer, so it's got two layers. And let me find my mouse here. Oh, here we go. All right, put this right here so I can, whoops, knocking everything over there. If we go, let's say, back one slide here, you can see that a phospholipid has the property of being amphipathic. Amphi, you know, like amphibians, they live in water and on land. They live in two places. Amphipathic means you have both a hydrophobic region. That is the lipid part created by those long fatty acid tails, you can see. And it's also got a hydrophilic region which is created by the phosphate head. And of course, the hydrophilic region forms uh, hydrogen bonds with water. That's why it interacts with water. And those fatty acid tails, well, they're all carbon and hydrogen, right? So you've got these nonpolar covalent bonds. They can't form any uh, hydrogen bonds with water. So the fatty acid tails, of course, are hydrophobic, but uh, they do form van der Waals forces. They do have van der Waals forces, and uh, you add those up just like um, like hydrogen bonds, and they can add up and make uh, these things kind of sticky. Okay, so here it is, phospholipid. We've got a lipid with a phosphate attached to it. It's amphipathic. It's got a hydrophilic head, phosphate head, and it has the hydrophobic tails. And so what happens in a cellular membrane is that the hydrophobic tails what they do is they swing into the inside of the membrane and the phosphate heads go on the outside so they interact with water either outside the cell or inside the cytoplasm of the cell and then those um, those hydrophobic tails the fatty acid tails are the inside of the membrane and of course this gives it selective permeability which means only certain things can pass through the membrane and you know for those of you that will see these pictures right here you can see that uh, membranes there's also you've got the phospholipids but embedded in membranes are lots of proteins and in fact if you were to take a 
a, a protein, I'm sorry, if you were to take a membrane and separate out all the proteins from the phospholipids by weight, most of our membranes are about 50% protein, 50% uh, of these phospholipids. So yeah, so there's lots of proteins embedded in the membrane and they often are called a, a uh, plasma membrane with the fluid mosaic model. And it gets the name fluid because the, 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 the phospholipids are moving around and it's got a mosaic of, of proteins that either uh, ride around on the top of it or are actually penetrate all the way through both sides. Those are called integral membrane proteins that we'll talk about. And some of those integral membrane proteins are even anchored to the cytoskeleton, which we'll talk about in later chapters, and also to the extracellular matrix. That's part of how we're held together here. Okay. Oh yeah, selective permeability. You guys already heard me give this, you know, you cannot pass. Uh, I'm the wielder, the secret fire, the flame of Anor. Go back to the shadows. Your dark fire will not avail you here, flame of Undun. And then, you know, Gandalf, of course, you know, says, you shall not pass, takes his staff and breaks the bridge at Khazad Doom. One of my favorite moments in movie history. I digress. I've already done this, but it's so much fun to think about uh, how I can incorporate pop culture like Gandalf facing down the Balrog of Morgoth to show that Gandalf is exhibiting selective permeability. He let the Fellowship of the Ring pass while stopping the Balrog. There you go. Kind of fun. Okay, now earlier, just a few minutes ago, I showed you a, um, a, a phospholipid made of fatty acids. And in eukaryotes, which is what you, me, plants, and animals are made of, eukaryotic cells, we use fatty acids. And in archaeans, they use a different building block called an isoprene. And you build these isoprenes together and you get what is called an isoprenoid tail. And there's some differences there. You can see that there are these little uh, methyl groups coming off to the sides there. This is a very strong uh, uh, structure. And that's part of the reason why our Archaeans are what we call extremophiles. Extreme just means extreme, you know, live everywhere. File means loving. So extremophiles can live in like boiling water, battery acid, uh, super cold water, super salty conditions, and, uh, and super alkaline conditions too, things with a very high pH. And a part of the reason why they are able to do that is because they have these isoprenoid tails. Okay. So Archean, which is one of the other domains of life, and I haven't talked too much about cells yet, but you probably have heard there's prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Eukaryotes, of course, are the more larger, more complex cells with the organelles and a cell nucleus and mitochondria. And then you've got the prokaryotes, which lack a nucleus, and they typically lack uh, internal membrane structures, although sometimes they do have them. So when it comes to domains, there's prokaryotes, which include bacteria and archaeans, and then there are the eukaryotes, which include, you know, all the multicellular things and a few unicellular things as well. Now, the reason why I'm going into these uh, Archaeans here and showing you that they have these isoprenoid tails, they also don't use the ester linkage. Remember, a fatty acid has a carboxyl group at the end of it. That's a C double bonded to O to a, and also bonded to a oxygen and a hydrogen as well. And that forms the ester linkage, which is a COC double bonded O, right? This is just COC. This is an ether linkage, also very strong as well. And uh, so, like I said, there's some, there's some key differences between the membranes of these um, archaeans and the bacteria. And it's not trivial. It's, it's actually quite profound. It, it turns out that, you know, when we talk about abiogenesis, that, um, you know, life, however it got started, whether it's metabolism first or co-evolving with metabolism getting more complex with DNA and RNA, well, for life to leave the rocks, that they their nursery grounds, they had to have a membrane surrounding them. 
And that's a very important part of abiogenesis is getting the membrane because life is a system. You need a boundary around your system. It looks like bacteria and archaeans that they acquired their membranes independently of each other. So you're looking at uh, two independent origins of the membranes. So the divergence between archaeans and bacteria likely dates all the way at the dawn of life itself. And I, I find that pretty interesting that these two things have been going on and on and on for billions of years. Okay. So like I was saying earlier, archaeans, they live in these extreme environments. This is a picture from Yellowstone where you have the hot springs and the water. You can see where it actually cools off, where it goes from boiling to in the hundreds, like 130, 140 degrees. And you can see all of those orange, orange thermophilic bacteria growing around the edge of the hot spring. And then as the water cools off, you actually get uh, um, cyanobacteria in there. So it transitions from orange to green, which is kind of cool. Okay. All right, so there's our fatty acid. We already talked about that. Talked about these ether, ether linkages. And then, of course, um, I got a little bit ahead of myself there. But basically, um, this is showing the lost city of Atlantis. That's a geological stru structure that lasts for thousands of years. It's created when warm water, you know, water percolates down into the ocean, gets around the mantle, heats up, and goes back up to the surface. And this warm, mineral-rich, alkaline water hits the oceans and it percolates and it precipitates out all of these, uh, the rock is, uh, precipitates out this formation. And we think that life may have gotten started in a structure, a geological structure, very, very similar to this. And, uh, you know, like I was saying that there's a lot of similarities amongst all living things. But that difference between the isoprenoid tails of an Archean with an ether linkage versus the uh, fatty acid tails with um, the um, yeah fatty acid tails with an e ester linkage is pretty big. And there's one other difference as well, and I'm trying to remember what it is. Uh, I can't remember exactly, but one of those is left-handed and the other is right-handed. I just can't remember which one is which right off the bat. But remember that's chirality. Uh, you've got your right and you've got your left forms. They are uh, mirror images of each other, but they aren't superimposable. And uh, so in life, chirality really matters. And the fact that they're using the different left and right forms is pretty big indication that, that uh, these things had an independent origin at basically the dawn of life. Okay. All right. So I was talking about that. I'm, what I'm looking to do here is get my slides up just a little bit so I can see them. Okay. So uh, one of the things about a phospholipid bilayer, I've talked a lot about you've got these hydrophilic heads. Those are the phosphate heads that are interacting with water. They are forming hydrogen bonds with water. Remember there's weak electrostatic attraction. And because they do that, the hydrophobic tails whether or not you're an isoprenoid tail or a fatty acid tail, doesn't matter. They don't like to be around water, so they go away from each other. And like I said, that's important because that allows a membrane to basically spontaneously form. Now, it's not violating any laws of thermodynamics at all. The issue here is that it's just energetically favorable and the, the universe loves things that are energetically favorable. Okay, well, let's keep going here. All right. So I like to show this illustration of a phospholipid bilayer, which is also a plasma membrane, which is also a cellular membrane. Remember, all of these things are basically the same. When you look at that, you probably see the phosphate heads and the little fatty acid tails. That's kind of like in blue. That's your phospholipid bilayer. That's your plasma membrane. Embedded in that membrane are lots of proteins. And in fact, something you guys are going to learn with Dr. Adama in a few, uh, after spring break, with uh, cell signaling, you'll realize that a lot of those what we call integral proteins that span between, uh, that span all the way through the membrane, 
those are actually what we call a G-protein coupled receptor. Yeah, you can see all those, how they loop through the membrane at least seven times. So one of the things I'm trying to get you to see is that membranes are not just made of phospholipids. They are loaded with proteins that serve many different functions for the cell. And here, once again, you can see these different proteins going through the membrane. And those proteins are involved with things like, you know, transport, both facilitated and active, facilitated diffusion and active transport, things we're going to talk about. Signal recognition. Uh, you know, we've got lots of s chemical signals floating through our body. They are there to elicit some type of cellular response. But for that cell to respond to any chemical signal, you have to have a receptor molecule. And like that G protein coupled receptor, we'll learn all about that later on, but that is a receptor uh, protein that allows a cell to receive a certain specific signal. There are also proteins to recognize cell from non-self, and there are proteins that will help anchor cells to each other to make, uh, well, we're a multicellular animal, right? You gotta anchor all the cells together and hold them together or we just all well, fall apart. Okay, so as we're going along, uh, uh, you know, I live out in the middle of nowhere. I, I do have satellite internet. It's been a little bit stormy. So if there's any problems with the stream, please let me know. I, I'm not sure there's a lot I can do about it, but if there's something I can, please let me know. Okay, let's get back to this. Membranes have selective permeability. I, I've already talked about that. You've got a hydrophobic interior, hydrophobic, made up of those fatty acid tails. What that means is that only certain substances are going to easily pass through the membrane. So fortunately for us, carbon dioxide and water easily go through, and so does oxygen. That means cells don't need any special structures to move carbon dioxide and oxygen across those membranes. They will just easily cross them on their own. Now water, it's it's hydrophilic molecule. So it's, but it's small. It's just H2O, right? It's just oxygen with a couple hydrogens. So even though water is a polar molecule, it can pass through the membrane, okay? Uh, just not as fast as something like oxygen, carbon dioxide, or nitrogen. And then you start to see things like glucose, sucrose. Well, these are hydrophilic molecules. They go through even slower than water because they're, they're larger than water. And then when you get to the ions, you can see chloride, potassium, that's that K+, and sodium, which is Na+. Uh, they go through even more slowly than your, your hydrophilic molecules like glucose. So what that's showing you is that there's selective permeability, small hydrophobic passes through pretty readily, ions, not so much. That 10 to the minus 12, that's like one in a trillion, right? So it's, it's a pretty low rate of uh, permeability for ions. So what that means is that membranes can really prevent the movement of ions across them. Now, of course, uh, um, oh, this is just showing that again in a little bit larger uh, um, video right here. Now, not all membranes are the same. Membranes can change dependent on time of year. In the summer, it's hot. In the winter, it's cold. So think about fish in the Rio Grande, right? You know, in the summertime, that water temperature in some places reaches like 80 degrees. And then I've been on the Rio Grande in February, busting through ice to collect fish when we were doing population monitoring on the Rio Grande when I first got here, like, oh gosh, 2004. So membranes can acclimate based on time of year and also different species of fish will have different properties of their membranes. So here's the thing. Membranes have to remain fluid. Think like a soap bubble. Uh, you've got to maintain this proper fluidity that allows for the right amount of permeability. We're going to regulate how fast things can move across a membrane. So here's the idea. You have short fatty acids 
And specifically, if you have short fatty acids that are unsaturated, and specifically short fatty acids that are in the cis transformation that are unsaturated, that causes those tails to bend, that allows for much higher permeability and maintains fluidity of a membrane during cold environments. So as the temperature decreases here in Albuquerque uh, throughout the fall, you can imagine a scenario where those fish are slowly changing their membranes to shorter, more unsaturated fats so that those membranes don't become solidified. And then you can imagine fish that live in cold water or bacteria that live in cold water might also have short fatty acid tails that are unsaturated with the double bonds and the cis position. Remember, cis is where they're both up like that and causes the tail to bend, rather than the trans, which causes the tail to be straight. Okay, now in the summertime, you know, it's springtime. Actually, we're not springtime yet. I know it's cold today. We're on a snow break, but we're going to get in the 60s by this, by this week again. Water is warming up, and as we go into March, April, May, and then, you know, it's hot by May and June, the water temperature is warmed up. If you had these short chain fatty acids, that your membrane might become too fluid. It's moving around too fast, it's too viscous. You can't regulate what comes through it. They become leaky. So at this point, to lower permeability, you would build longer fatty acids and they would be saturated. And remember, the longer they are and the more saturated they are, they are flat, they stack, and these are where these van der Waals forces start to come into play on those hydrophobic heads, I mean, sorry, on those hydrophobic tails. And as a result, you can lower the viscosity. You can reduce permeability, even though the temperature is warming up. Because, you know, don't forget, if you got a higher temperature, you have more thermal energy. That's kinetic energy. Those things are moving around faster. The individual triglycerides move faster which, like I said, that, that increases permeability. So to slow them down, you increase the length of your fatty acid tails, you make them more saturated, and that lowers permeability, makes a, a thicker membrane to flow through, but also those van der Waals forces become important as well. Okay. All right. Animals. We make cholesterol. And uh, I talked about cholesterol, the LDLs and HDLs on Tuesday, but basically um, cholesterol is kind of like a buffer inside of our, our membranes. We have to have it. And one of the things that cholesterol does is it helps reduce the permeability of our membranes. It keeps them from becoming too fluid, too viscous. And like I said, that's very important because that will uh, regulate, it'll allow the cell to regulate very tightly how leaky they want that membrane to be, right? And there are cases where it's okay to leak a little bit. And what I'm talking about is leaking maybe little um, ions, some glucose in there. And there's other times when you want to like shut that down completely. But if you, if you make your membrane, you know, completely solid, like bacon fat, that's bad for the cell because what happens is oxygen can't get into your cell you cut most of our cells off from oxygen, they're not gonna do well for very long. And also you can't get rid of the carbon dioxide that would normally just diffuse across the membrane. Okay. So uh, now some of the slides I'm gonna talk about here, uh, excuse the number of words on these slides. I made a lot of them during COVID uh, and I was trying to put lots of information on slides and I just, I haven't removed them yet. Uh, I know that when you're, you get distracted a little bit, trying to write all this information down, but um, if we can just kind of follow along with the narration here, the, the point here is that temperature strongly affects membrane fluidity. I've talked about this. If you're a cold water fish f swimming around an Alaskan glacier, and they do, you might have these very short polyunsaturated fatty acid chains. Now, you've heard I'm sure that eating like cold water fish is healthy for you. And the reason why cold water fish are healthy for you is because of course, polyunsaturated fats, including omega-3s, which is an essential fat. Now remember, essential means 
Uh, you have to have it, but you can't make it. And that's very different from like the essential oils you might buy at a, uh, at a health food store, right? It's like, it has the essence of the plant. No, that's, that's not necessarily what we're talking about here in biology. If something's essential, you have to have it, but you can't make it. Okay. So salmon, very, very good for you. Great source of protein full of the uh, omega threes and the unsaturated fats that we need. Okay. So I've talked about this cells regulate membrane fluidity to acclimate to their environment. If you're getting hotter, you're going to have longer fatty acid tails. They'll be more saturated as you're getting colder. You guys know the answer to this. You get colder, their tails get shorter and they get more polyunsaturated, which means they're all bent. That also prevents the van der Waals forces from making those things stick together. So they move around faster in cooler temperatures if, because of those uh, tails being shorter and uh, they're more permeable. So cells can regulate basically uh, about the same amount of permeability, whether it's hot or cold. Okay. So when you guys are reviewing this, just remember to review the structure of phospholipids. Uh, we're going to talk about, remember there's two origins of cellular membranes. And uh, we talked a lot about the structure of those membranes, how they correlate to the function, uh, not only them forming spontaneously the phospholipid bilayer, but also how cells can alter those fatty acid chains to, main to maintain uh, permeability um, regardless of the temperature outside. Okay, now let's switch gears here. I'm done with that one. Now, let's oh you can see my all my files there um let's go here and i'm gonna just lower that in case anybody hits me up on the top chat um in case you have a question i i, I can i've actually got three screens in front of me i've got my powerpoint on one i've got my green screen and the video streaming information on the second one on the middle one and then I have my upcoming slides on the third one. And I can see your top chat because I've got my, my YouTube streaming there. So I can see that. So if you have a question, you know, you can, you can hit me up and let me know that uh, if you have a question or not. Okay. In, in uh, 6.3, uh, this is a, for those of you following along, that's, of course, in Freeman's book. Uh, let's talk about how molecules move across a cellular membrane. And uh, this is really important, right? Because... Cells are open systems, right? Life is an open system. We have energy that flows through us. We have to take in materials from the environment and we have to remove materials out of our cells. So how do we do that, right? Well, one of the principles that we really need to know is diffusion and osmosis. Okay, I got a lot of words on there, but, uh, right, but basically here's how it works. Diffusion, this is the spontaneous movement of a substance down a concentration gradient. So it's moving from areas where it's more concentrated to areas where it's less concentrated. Okay, that would be diffusion. And of course, I've got a, a picture there showing where if you put dye in a beaker, it eventually gets uh, diffused. And I have a video of that somewhere I'll post for you guys. Now, I mentioned this word concentration gradient. And I realized a few years ago that, you know, we don't really know what gradients are. It's like we talk about gradients, but here's a gradient. A gradient is a change in the value of something over a distance. Okay. So you experience gradients all the time. It's cold outside. You walk from the inside of your house to the outside or from the outside into a building, you are going through a thermal gradient. So the temperature changes as you move a distance, as you walk through the door, right? That's a thermal gradient. Go hiking. I love going hiking. I actually love hiking uphill. As I go uphill, I'm going up an elevational gradient because I'm going up an elevation as I go a distance, right? And if you look at this picture on the slide right here, you can see I've got elevation zero to 35 meters. It's gone as imagine a hill. You put the ball at the top of the hill 
let the ball go and it rolls down and specifically potential energy because the ball has potential energy because it's at the top of the hill it's relative to its uh, position you let the ball go it rolls down the hill on its own that potential energy gets transformed into kinetic energy that is very important so if you notice i've also got concentration on there as well and it goes from zero parts per thousand which would be pure water all the way to 35 parts per thousand I, I didn't come up with that on accident that is the salinity of our oceans and if you're not familiar with part per thousand ppt a part per thousand is imagine i i reach into some salt water the, you go to the ocean, go to the beach, you grab some water, and you grab a thousand parts of that water. Well, if I've got 35 parts per thousand salinity, then approximately 35 parts will be salt, and 965 parts will be water. That's why it's 35 parts per thousand. And that so that's a gradient. And what that means is, if I've got a solute over here that's 35 parts per thousand those solutes will diffuse down their concentration gradient until they reach equilibrium and if you remember the ball rolling down the hill potential energy at the top of the hill gets oh i'm coming gets transformed into kinetic energy as it rolls down the hill guess what if you have a concentration gradient you have potential energy stored in the gradient. As your solutes diffuse down their gradient, that potential energy is transformed to kinetic energy. And guess what? Your cells can use that to do work. Okay, and that's exactly what I'm talking about here, but I am going to move on. Okay, so there it is. You put a solute in water. Water is the solvent. And then the solute, that dye would be the solute, okay? So if I added what? If I added salt or sugar or electrolytes to that water right there, those would be the solutes, water would be the solvent, and it will spread out until it reaches equilibrium. And that's where the salt would be everywhere, or as you can see, that purple dye, it's reached equilibrium on the right. And at that point, uh, you still have the same amount of energy, you just have... Uh, high entropy, the water molecules are all moving the same speed as they were just a few minutes ago. But because you're in equilibrium, you have high entropy, it's a stable state, you no longer have energy available to do work. So equilibrium versus not in equilibrium. You can imagine you've got a semi-permeable membrane and what will happen is there's a concentration gradient, the solutes are higher on the left side compared to the right side. And um, that ability to move from one side to the other, cells harness that. Remember, electrolytes cannot cross a cell membrane. So some way they let that in and they can harness those ions moving down their concentration gradient to do work. And uh, to me, that's pretty fascinating that they do that. Okay. And this system will go until it reaches equilibrium. And if you remember, I, I told you uh, one time that um, life is uh, a system out of equilibrium. You never want to be in equilibrium with your environment uh, because what will happen is uh, you'd be, well, you couldn't do any work, but you'd be basically some carbon dioxide, water, and a few minerals. Okay. Can that be considered a percentage if you do the math 35 out of 1,000? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a percentage. Um, exactly. Good, good question there. So 35. So we're going back to a question I just see. I just saw pop up on my top chat there. Um, yeah, 35 parts per thousand is a percentage. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Now here is a a misconception about diffusion and energy. Now we know as a solute is diffusing down its concentration gradient, that diffusion can be harnessed to do work. It's a spontaneous reaction because it's reaching equilibrium, which is energetically favorable. Entropy is increasing. You have to have energy for diffusion to work. 
I know. You read all these things, oh, diffusion doesn't require energy. No, it absolutely requires energy for diffusion to work. Because if you're moving from areas of high concentration to low concentration, you're, you're moving, right? Moving, movement is a form of kinetic energy. To move, you have to have kinetic energy. If there's no kinetic energy in the system, there's no diffusion, can't move, there's no energy. The difference is, and this difference is subtle but important. You'll get a test question on this, I'm certain. You, um, you do not need to input any additional energy into the system. So for diffusion to occur in a cell, whether it's oxygen diffusing into a cell, you start exercising, your muscles are burning oxygen, oxygen will diffuse into the cell, it'll do it on its own. The cell doesn't have to spend any work doing it. So for diffusion to occur, you don't need to add work. It just uses the energy that's already present in the system. So you can imagine if you're warmer, diffusion will go faster than if you're colder. That's why uh, here's my tea right here. Uh, to make tea, you often heat it up so that the water will diffuse through the tea bag and through the tea leaves and extract all the yumminess in the tea. And the hotter the water, the faster it does it. Yum, green tea. I know, I know, I'm trying to stay off my Mountain Dew habit here. Okay, and yes, that is a liter and a half of tea. I, I make a big batch and then drink it. Okay, so here it is. Uh, diffusion does require energy, but you, uh, you don't have to add energy to it. Okay. The cousin of diffusion is something called osmosis, okay? This is diffusion specifically for water. And in fact, osmosis means to push. Now, for those of you that have read uh, uh, Freeman's book, chapter six, they talk about how water flows from areas where there's a lower concentration of solutes to a higher concentration of solutes. Uh, I don't know why they describe it like that. It's not incorrect. But there's a better way to think about the movement of water and uh, a much more accurate way to describe the movement of water. And in fact, in the later chapters in the book, they talk about what is called water potential. So like I said, I think there's a bit of a disconnect between the later chapters and the, these early chapters, right? I don't think there's authors communicated with each other because when you get to plant, animal, form, and function, we talk about something called water potential. And osmosis flows from where you have the highest water potential to the lowest water potential. Well, you might be making a connection all of a sudden. If water is flowing from where there's fewer solutes, right, to where there's more solutes, water is flowing from high potential to low potential, then that should let you know that solutes and water lower water potential. So, I know there's tons of words here. I'll, I'll fix this uh, next time so that there's not as many words. And don't worry, when I post my, my PowerPoints in the future, I'll, I'll keep all the words on there for them. But they can be a little distracting in a lecture. But let's take a look at this. You see the on, on the right, the far right, you see that um, there's a, you've got fewer um, solutes. And on the other side, you've got more solutes. And the water is flowing from where there's less solutes to where there's more solutes. Water is flowing from high potential to low potential. And of course, the water level is changing as it does that because water is pushing up the column, hence the name osmosis, which means to push. The other diagram in there shows, um, it looks like maybe a, a sugar or something, some type of solute. The reason why salt or sugar or anything you can dissolve in water lowers the water potential is because you add salt to water. Salt just splits into sodium ions and chloride ions. They have negative and positive charge. Water is a polar molecule. It is attracted to the sodium and the chloride ions. That's why electrolytes can dissolve in water, right? Because they can form these electrostatic attractions. But if you have something like sodium, right? It's, pretty po it's got a positive, a plus one charge, It'll attract these water molecules and hold on to them and prevent them from moving. 
And in fact, you can imagine a scenario where if you have a bunch of table salt and you drop some water in there, good luck getting that water out, right? That's because the salt ions are holding on to that water very tightly, so it's very low potential. So now you might be thinking, well, where is water the highest potential? That would, of course, be pure water. And pure water will always, that water always has the highest potential and it will flow to anything else that has solutes in it until it basically reaches equilibrium, sort of. There are some factors like pressure, gravity, that will limit how far up that column the water can go. So there's lots of things that affect uh, water potential. When you start talking about plants, gravity is one of those things. But for cell and molecular biology today, mostly the, the issue is going to be uh, um, solutes. Okay. Now, that brings us up to some other definitions we need to know. And uh, honestly, you know, sometimes we get these confused. So let me see if I can, um, if I can walk us through this. Now, if you've got a cell and it's got the same solute concentration outside the cell as inside the cell, let's say five parts per thousand, then we would say that is in an isotonic solution. Iso means the same. And of course, tonicity has to do with the solutes, right? So if you're in an isotonic situation, you don't have any net movement of water, okay? Water is going in, water is coming out, and it's going back and forth at the same rate. So there, there's no net movement of water. Okay, now, a hypertonic solution. A hypertonic solution means you have water potential is higher on the outside of the cell. So imagine you've got a cell and uh, you put it in salty water. There's more solutes outside the cell. You've got lower water potential because the solutes are holding on to the water basically. So what happens is water will diffuse out of the cell, right through the membrane, and that cell will shrink. That, water, that cell will become dehydrated. Okay, and it can actually kill the cell. On the flip side, imagine you take a cell and you put it in pure water. What will happen then is pure water has no solutes, has the highest potential you can have. Water will flow from high potential to low potential. Water will flow from outside the cell to inside the cell, and the cell will swell. And in fact, if, uh, if it swells up enough, it can, it can actually burst. Okay, so that's hypotonic, hypertonic, and isotonic. And uh, I will always, in a test question, make sure it's clear who's hypertonic to what. And I usually do it just like I showed right here. I will say, hey, a cell is in a hypertonic solution. The cell is in a hypotonic solution. What will happen to that cell? That's how I ask that kind of question is to not uh, have it confusing. And of course, uh, for those of you interested in health, um, as my poor family is uh, getting in an all of them are getting colds and sore throats. If I say I have a sore throat, my mom, if she's watching today, has a, I, I laugh, she has a fixed action pattern or a fixed action response, which means I have a sore throat and my mom must say, go gargle with salt water. Like it is becoming a running joke in our family. It's a, it's a behavioral thing, right? That you study where if you, if you have a stimulus, there's a response that must be carried out to completion. I have a sore throat. Go gargle with salt water. Okay, wives tell her, does it actually work? Hmm. Well, you get a sore throat, you get bacteria on the back of your throat, and that bacteria is causing an inflammation. You're getting lots of, uh, your, your throat's becoming inflamed. So when you gargle with salt water, the salt water is hypertonic compared to those bacterial cells and the cells in your, or the, your inflamed cells. So it draws some of the, uh, liquid out of the cells, reduces the inflammation, and yes, your uh, throat feels better. Okay. See, there's useful applications of this stuff, just even in during cold season. Now, let's talk about membrane transport. There's, of course, simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, where you need a protein to help you get through it, you're facilitating it, 
And then of course there is active transport. Now, from here on, I'm gonna follow the book and then I'm going to add some stuff that's not in this chapter, but it's actually incredibly important because here's some good words for you. Um, oh, I don't need to make that connection right now. Cells use transport for so many reasons. If you're a fish in the ocean, you use transport to maintain water balance because believe it or not, you, me, and most animals have no mechanism to actively move water into our cells. We don't pump water into our cells. You need more water in your cells, you pump electrolytes into your cell, lower the water potential, and water moves in the cell. You want less water in your cell? Guess what? You pump electrolytes out of your cell, or you allow electrolytes to exit the cell, and the cell will lose water. So. You know, we, we need transport to maintain water balance. I'm up here standing around arm waving, right? Every movement I'm making from standing here to arm waving to even talking, breathing, heart beating, uh, digesting as I drink some water, every single movement is dependent on muscle contraction, which is controlled by our nervous system. And that's what our nervous system allows us to do. Coordinate our muscles so we can move through the environment. And our big brain is, a lot of that is to control our movements at a very fine scale. Nervous conductance and muscle contraction all rely on both active transport and facilitated diffusion. You, I mean, without these things, they will not happen. Uh, you got a stomach. I, I'm sitting here drinking some tea, so I'm not really digesting so much of the tea here. Mm, yum. But when I'm going to go eat lunch after this, well, I'm going to digest that lunch. And as you know, there's hydrochloric acid inside of your stomach. Well, it just doesn't get there on its own. It relies on chloride ion channels and proton pumps. And for those of you that will ever take... Uh, a plant and animal form and function with me in the summertime. And you can ask my previous students, they know that I'm just fascinated with proton pumps. Uh, glucose absorption, uh, you go eat some food. You, we rely on transport to move glucose into our cells. Uh, water movement of plants. Plants have to have water move into the roots, especially in dry conditions. And they do that with active transport. Not of the water, they're changing the electrolytes. And of course, sugar transport in plants and phloem loading and all of these things require transport. So I hope I made the case that it's, uh, there's a lot and I'll show you some examples here after we go through this. Diffusion, I mean, we just talked about it. Membranes have selective permeability. So that means that small hydrophobic molecules easily cross a membrane. You know, you've got a uh, carbon dioxide will diffuse out of a metabolically active cell oxygen will easily diffuse into it, nitrogen as well. Water moves more slowly through the membrane, but adequately for most cells. But as you'll learn, we can even facilitate the transport or the diffusion of water out of cells through an aquaporin. Glucose, yet yeah, slower, and of course, importantly, membranes are barriers to ions, which are our electrolytes. Sodium, potassium, chloride, magnesium. Okay. I already talked about this. I don't need to go into this too much more again. You can uh, also rewind rewind this and review how uh, the shorter fatty acids that are polyunsaturated lead to more fluidity and higher permeability uh, and how the longer chains lead to lower permeability and less fluidity. Okay. Yeah. All right. So simple diffusion is one way substances exit and enter the cell. Just talked about water moves both ways. Oxygen usually diffuses into our cells. Carbon dioxide typically diffuses out of our cells. And the reason why is because of our metabolism, which you will learn after spring break. Okay, now importantly, we have facilitated transport because as you realize, glucose moves slowly through a membrane. Ions, not so much. And regulating ions inside of our cells is just a paramount, paramount importance, okay? So, here we go. To facilitate the movement of ions in and out of our cells, we need proteins. 
And in fact, there are so many proteins embedded in the membrane. I already told you, right? It's like 50% of our membrane by weight are proteins. And a lot of these proteins are floating around and they go all the way through the cell and they are channels. They are channels and they allow ions to move in and out of the cell, okay? And we call this a fluid mosaic model because the individual triglycerides, I mean, sorry, the individual little uh, phospholipids are moving around like this. They're not really co uh, connected to each other through any type of covalent bonding. Uh, so you've got all these proteins embedded in the membrane that are floating around. So it's fluid and there's a mosaic of proteins, hence fluid mosaic model there. Okay, so one thing that cells must do, you already know what I'm going to say, they regulate their ions across the membrane. Okay, they're usually moving sodium out, moving potassium in, and then, you know, the membranes form this barrier. And importantly, they form what is called an electrochemical gradient, something that we'll talk more about later, but basically electrochemical gradient, well, ions are charged. So if I'm building up a plus charge on one side and a negative charge on the other side, I have an electrical gradient. And because of course, um, sodium and potassium and chloride are, are types of chemicals, you have a chemical gradient, you combine them and you have what is called an electrochemical gradient. So we move sodium out, move potassium in. I know you're thinking they're both positively charged but they're moving more sodium out than they're moving the potassium in. Okay. So one way that cells can allow the movement of ions is they have these uh, membrane proteins through facilitated diffusion. You can have a channel or you can have a carrier protein. Let's take a closer look. There's an aquaporin. Your kidneys are constantly filtering lots and lots of water. And you need it to move through the cells a little bit more fast, a little bit faster than uh, than would work with diffusion. So there are these protein channels called an aquaporin. They allow water to diffuse, or actually through osmosis through them, to increase water movement through things like your kidneys. Once again, we're relying on the energy already in the system. The cells, they're not doing any extra work here. They're, they're not using their own energy. Okay, we also have channels, other types of channels. And most channels are gated. They're gated. What that means is that you can open and close those gates. And I'll come back to that in a second. Another very important type of diffusion is, uh, I mean, a facilitated diffusion, of course, is um, ATP synthase, which is something you're going to learn a lot about coming up for both photosynthesis and uh, cellular respiration, but basically the diffusion, the facilitated diffusion of protons is used to make lots of ATP in a process called chemiosmosis, chemical pushing. These protons are pushing their way through. So proton gradients are incredibly important for life, for making ATP and for plants, you'll learn in 304 that they're, they're important for a lot of things. So I told you just a second ago that most ion channels are gated. They open and they close. They open and they close. What that means is the cells can regulate the diffusion of ions or electrolytes in and out of their cells. Okay. So one of them uh, is a voltage gated channel. And I told you as you move uh, an electrolyte like um, sodium out of a cell and you move potassium into the cell. All right. I'm moving more sodium out than potassium in. You create an electrical chemical gradient. So you can imagine a scenario where that membrane potential changes, right? The voltage changes. The voltage is a difference between the plus and the minus or the, or the difference in the charge. There are scenarios when that voltage changes, a uh, uh, gated, a uh, uh, a voltage gated ion channel will open or close. So basically if you've got a, uh, a chemical signal that, uh, open that can open and close those gates. And you know what? I just realized I am way past, 
1045 here. My my apologies. So I'm going to stop right here with uh, ion channels, um, gated ion channels. I will continue on later. I forgot that um, with the late start that I'm sitting here looking at my timer thinking I've got 20 more minutes, not realizing it's 1055. My apologies for anybody that had to be somewhere. I'm just going to stop right here. And uh, in the next class, I'll only go to right here as well. And we'll finish up on, we'll review and then finish on Tuesday. All right, so you guys have a, a good weekend. Let's see if I can stop this stream. Here we go.